10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, here we go. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to church. Um, wherever you are and whoever you are, we're glad that you could join us this morning. Some of you will be watching live and some of you will be watching a catch-up. Um, if you are watching live and you're using our church online program, there's a great chat box in there that you can um, write in and let us know you're watching. And throughout the next hour or so as we watch this together, um, there's a live prayer um, there's a live prayer button that you can press, which allows you to talk with one of the leaders of the church if you want a private conversation or one of us to pray for you. We'd encourage you just to do that as well. The passage of scripture this week that's just been on my mind and my heart is in Lamentations chapter three. This is a, a chapter where the people of God are in despair, darkness and desperation. It's a grim, grim first half of the chapter. But there's this moment in the chapter that brings hope, a turning point verse. Uh, and we read it in verse 21. It says, But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. A well-known, uh, amazing passage of scripture. Uh, but my encouragement to you this morning, and as I read that, what I felt a stirring in my heart for is that for some of us today, we're going to have a turning point moment. We're going to come out of crisis and move into hope. We're going to come out of despair into rejoicing and out of fear into God's provision over our lives. And that can happen today, right now, wherever you are. A turning point moment because we are focused on the faithfulness of God and not on the circumstances that are around us. So we're going to worship this morning. We're going to pray. We're going to sing. And um, wherever you are, I want to encourage you to, to stand, to maybe raise your hands and um, to engage with God because he is worth it. We're going to sing together. Let's sing. Bless the Lord. Oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass And whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, worship Your holy name. Your rich in love. You're slow to anger Your name is great And your heart is kind 
for all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find thank you Lord bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship is holy Worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years, then forevermore, forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. Worship the holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Never before, oh my soul. Worship Your holy. Worship your holy name. Worship your holy name. I'm thankful to God for technology because even in this difficult period of lockdown, I'm still able to keep in touch with my friends and family, which is good because it helps me still feel connected to people. And also technology means that we can meet as a body of Christ on a Sunday and during the week as well, which is good because we can still worship together even though we're in different locations. So I give God the glory for making this possible. Thank you, God, for your promise in Isaiah 41, 13, which says, I am the Lord who takes a hold of your hand and says, I will help you. What I'm thankful for is mine and my family's health and for all the great NHS workers that are doing a great job saving lives at the moment. Um, I'd like to thank God for my family. I'd like to thank God for our health. I'd like to thank him for keeping me, my family, my dad safe. I want to thank him for his job, that so far nothing bad has happened to him or any of us. I'd like to thank him that none of us are needing to go to the hospital or anything like that. Mandy 
can see it, you're working Even when I can feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop to have for breakfast. Mm -hmm. Tilly, what do you like? Uh, porridge. Porridge. Everyone else, can you shout out and tell me what you like? Rice Krispies? Ooh, waffles. Good mm. choice. Pancakes? Weetabix? Such good choices. Well, today we're going to find out about what Jesus and his friends like to have for breakfast. But before we do that, let's try and remember what we did last week. So last week we learned about Easter Sunday. So we learned about how Jesus died, but then he came alive again. It was part of the great rescue plan. He made it possible for us to be forgiven for our wrong choices and to get to know Father God. So then we learned that Jesus was alive. And so lots of people saw him alive. So Mary, there was two men on the road to Emmaus and the disciples. The disciples saw Jesus after he came alive when they were in a locked room and suddenly Jesus appeared. And that happened not just once, but twice. Whoa. And now we're going to learn about the third time uh, that they saw Jesus alive again. So Peter was a fisherman. So he decided to go and fish in the Sea of Galilee, which was a brilliant spot to catch fish. And several of the other disciples wanted to catch fish too, because they didn't know what else to do. It was night time, and that was the perfect time to catch lots and lots of fish. So they all got into the boat, they rowed out into the, the water, and then threw out their nets and waited for the fish just to swim in. And they waited and they waited, and they waited. And every so often they would pull out the nets and look in them, and there was nothing, not a single fish. So they kept on throwing the nets back out and waiting for the fish. And they did this all night. And by the morning time, they were really, really tired and really discouraged. And then early in the morning, this man came walking along the beach and they, he shouted out to them, friends, have you caught any fish? And they shouted back, no, we've not caught any. And that the man said, well, throw your, your net on the right side of the boat and then you'll catch loads of fish. And you know what? They did exactly what he said. They threw the net over the other side of the boat 
and suddenly loads and loads of fish were caught in it. It was so, so full, it kept on pulling and pulling and pulling. In fact, the Bible tells us there are 153 large fish. That's massive, tons and tons of fish. It was so heavy, they couldn't even lift it into the boat. No. So Peter thought, who is this person who told us to throw the net on the other side of the boat? So he looked out, peered out, and suddenly realised it was Jesus. He jumped out of the boat straight away and started swimming all the way out onto the boat, uh, the beach, to see Jesus. And all of his friends started rowing the boat, trying to get it all the way over to, to Jesus. And when they got there, they realised that there was a fire on the, the beach and they saw some fish cooking on the fire and some bread. Um, and Jesus asked them to have breakfast with them. And you know what? Of course, they said yes. So they had breakfast. And what do you think they had for, for breakfast with Jesus? Fish. That's right. Fish. Some of the fish that they caught. So they had breakfast on the bus. And it's yeah. a bit strange to have fish for breakfast. Tilly, do you have fish for breakfast? Yeah. No. yeah. But that's what Jesus and his friends like. So they all had cooked fish uh, for, for breakfast and some, some of the bread. And Jesus' friends were really, really happy that, that Jesus was alive again. They were so, so excited. So Jesus was definitely alive. His friends had seen him and lots of other people had seen him too. And just like the disciples were sad and scared at first and then had such joy when they realised that Jesus had come back to life, we can have such joy and comfort from knowing Jesus too. And just like Jesus guided them and led them to find fish, he leads and guides us too. He's so good to us. And just like Jesus provided breakfast for them, Jesus provides things for us too. He provides us with food, with money, with a house, with friends, with so many things, with peace, everything we need, we can ask him for and he'll provide for us because he's so good. And do you know what? Jesus talks to us. He gives us encouragement and he helps us to know what to do, what choices to make. Jesus is always there for us and you can always talk to him no matter what. So let's talk to Jesus now. So Jesus, I thank you that you're alive. Jesus, I thank you that we can trust you and that we can talk to you and that you'll lead us, you'll guide us, you provide for us. And Jesus, I ask that every single person listening would talk to you this week and that they would hear you speaking to them, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, for our craft this week, what we're going to do is we are going to make some fish. So you might want to draw and colour a fish or cover it in sticky tissue paper and glue. Uh, or you might just want to draw a picture from the story you can choose. But make sure you spend some time talking to Jesus this week. OK, so we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye. 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 Well, this is the part of the service now where we would normally move on to our giving. And when we meet together, we usually have people go around with baskets and, and people put in their tithes and offerings. But we can't do that. You guys are at home. And um, so we're looking to do that digitally now. Um, this is really an act of worship for us as, as ECF. And um, it's saying to God, you're in control of my finances and you are my provider. It's our way of saying that together. If you're joining us from another church or tuning in uh, from another church, I want to encourage you, do not give to us. Please look at giving to your own local church and your own uh, body where you've been called, called to. That's where you should be giving to over the next few weeks and months. Um, so the details are on screen. There's two ways you can give. You can give via a bags transfer. Thanks to everyone who's moved over to that already. That's been helpful for us to administrate. But the second way we've set up for you to give um, is on our website, ecfpaisley.org forward slash giving. You can go on there. It's a secure online payment that you can make um, on there as well. I finally just want to say, let's make sure we're supporting our local businesses and local charities outside of the church as well. We know that many people are going to be struggling um, over the next few weeks. Um, let's just pray for them just now. Father, we thank you that we can trust in you as Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides. You provide everything we need. You are our daily bread. Lord, we ask that you would give peace to every person who's struggling with anxiety in the midst of this crisis. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Caught up in your 
just want you. Good morning, another service from our homes and uh, I hope you're all doing well in this lockdown. Um, it's a very interesting time that we're in and I want to talk about spending time with God. We'll do that either, either for the next two or three weeks and uh, I hope really that you grasp something that, that God wants to say to you. Let's just pray before we do that. Father, we thank you that the Bible is so relevant and it speaks to us all individually and together. And I ask Holy Spirit, you will come and take anything that's said today and speak to us, or even something that's not said, Lord, that you, by me, you will speak into our hearts and into our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to, to read a couple of accounts of David's life. Now, David was a king. You might know him if you, you've heard of David and Goliath. This is who we're talking about. And he became the king of the whole of Israel. And he's, he was quite an incredible man. And he had a friend called Jonathan, and Jonathan was the king's son. And the king, Saul, the, uh, Jonathan's father, hated David because he felt threatened by him, and he tried to kill him all the time. And uh, But Jonathan and David loved each other, his incredibly close relationship as brothers. And um, so we're going to find out when the, the two of them are separated, because David was being chased by King Saul and his army, and, and uh, Jonathan was with his dad. And um, we'll find out what happens here. It says, while David was at Horesh in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his, his life. And Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David at Horesh and helped him to find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You shall be king over Israel and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. Then Jonathan went home, but David remained in Horesh. Now that's from the, the book of First Samuel, First Samuel 23. But if we go into First Samuel 30, we find a, a different scenario. David was, a, was leading his, his ar own army, and a, the enemy, enemy had come to his camp and had ransacked the camp and stolen all their wives and all their belongings. Well, let's just read what happened this here. When David and his men came to Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam and Abigail, and David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters, but David found strength in the Lord his God. You know, it, it's, it was awful. Everything went away. Everything was taken away. And also his own men who loved him, actually, they were so bitter and, and uh, worried and became angry that they wanted to stone David to death. But it says, but David found strength in the Lord. In the first scenario, when Jonathan came, it says that Jonathan came to help him find strength in God. But now David was on his own. He didn't have anyone with him whatsoever. And he had to find God, God's strength for himself. And he must have been thinking, what have I done? Is it just my own ego that I've led these men into this situation? Am I really called to be king? But the thing we find about David is that he had a history in God. He was a, someone who, as, even as a young boy, was a worshipper and he knew God intimately. That's why the Psalms that he wrote were very intimate and deep. So David wrote, the Lord is my shepherd. So as a shepherd, he understood what a shepherd's role was and what, how sheep related to the, sh the shepherd. And so he was a man who, who understood what it was to be led by his God, who was a shepherd. And he was just about to step into his destiny at this point to be king. And yet everything seemed to come against him. But God had arranged this situation as part of his preparation. And I want to say to EC the ECF family who are watching that, that God has got us ready for this situation that we're in, that we find ourselves in with the coronavirus and just being separated and so on. And he's, over the last wee while, if you've been listening to God, you will understand that and see that he has actually got us to this point. For example, the missional communities have become settled over the last few months. 
And that's the way that we operate and the way we communicate and you know, we encourage one another within those groups. God talked to us about all taking responsibility and each one of us need to take responsibility for our own walk with God at this time instead of just relying on other people. He was challenging our church mentality where we just think about church as being an organisation and not realise that we're called to the kingdom of God which is a spiritual supernatural dimension that God has called each one of us to. He's called us to prayer. Over the last three or four years, we've had push, which is pray until something happens. Not many people have responded to that. And I wish you had, because we'd have been even more prepared if that had been the case. But we're more missional as a church. We're looking for ways, more and more ways, to, to share the love of Jesus with those around about us. Um, on a practical level, we've been using Zoom with the missional, leaders, uh, missional community leaders for the last couple of years. And so we're used to Zoom. Because of Ralston, the, the branch that we had there until last year, we have had the equipment where we can do a online a, sort of live streaming services, which we were, we were able to do for two, two, two Sundays anyway, before the lockdown came. But there was also spiritually the sense of something big was going to happen, as if something was going to break in the world. And of course, here we are in this situation that we're in. And then God has talked to us about that he's shaking his church and he's shaking his church, he's shaking the ECF because it's not the same as it was and we'll come to that in a minute. And then at the beginning of this year, uh, God spoke, spoke to us about warfare, word and worship, that we, we, we set aside time, uh, two months to s study specific verses of the Bible, to memorise it and for it to become part of us. He's calling us into a greater worship and I want to see and now expect to see that we will, the worship will be higher than ever before when we come back together, if we respond to what he's saying. But the other one was warfare, and God has called us into a place of warfare, and we spent a night doing that eh, on Zoom, but also it's something we're called to do all the time. Now, so, so God pre is preparing us, but we are more separate than, than before. For some, we might be in families or couples, but for others, you might be on your own. But whether, whatever our home situation is like, we are separated from the whole body of, of, the, of uh, the church, and it's a time for us to grow. It's a time for us to catch up on what God wants to do in us and to say to us, because he wants to speak to his whole church throughout the world to be ready, because I believe that we're in the times when, when God is preparing his church for the return of Jesus Christ. Now, any follower who is forth their salt, that's somebody who really wants to follow Jesus and submits to his authority, anyone like that will go through times of testing, where it's times of just you and God, that no one can help you, no one seems to have the answer, anything you try to do is, is, is a, just doesn't work, but it's God wanting to do something in you, so he can show, him, show you more of himself and his ways. And it's a lonely place to be. And I want you to hear this because I really believe God, God gave me this as a word for us as a church. And it's maybe a word for the church as well. But God has started to strip away church as we know it to get the church that he wants. God has stripped away the church as we know it to get the church that he wants. He's stripping away ECF as we know it to get the ECF that he wants. And he will get his way. And I just hope that each one of us respond to what he's doing, otherwise we, we will not be part of it. Some churches will disappear. Some shallow Christians will disappear. But those who know God will do great things. And those churches and those disciples of Jesus who are submitted to him and understand the times that we're in and know what we should be doing as we're led by the Spirit, will, then we will know him like never before. If we take this opportunity to seek him. You see, it's times of testing. It's times when our whole life has been shaken. We've talked about that over the last few weeks. It's, but you see, it's about you and God. That's what your life is about, primarily. It's about your relationship with God. Whether we have one or not is the first thing. And secondly, here's the question we need to ask ourselves. Do I live for God? Here's the question I want to ask you. Do, do you live for God? Does your life, your time, your energy, your lifestyle your, and your emotions centre around him? 
You see, we need to make time for God every day in our lives. We live in the age of communication. There's radio, TV, phones, mobiles, email, computers, Skype and Zoom. And I don't know about you, but I'm a bit Zoomed out these days because I have had not just church meetings with the, in, in ECF, but out with, with other leaders as well. You see, machines and technology were developed really to give us an easier life. The trouble is that, that while we save time doing one task, we're expected to do another three tasks as well. So at one time, a man going to maybe Edinburgh would sit in a cart for maybe, I don't know how long it takes to go in a cart, I've never gone to Edinburgh in a cart, but he would be on this cart for a longer time than it takes to drive through there. It maybe took him nearly all day, I don't know. But he would have time to think and time to talk to people, time to enjoy nature and maybe to seek God. Today we rely on Google more than we do God. And you see, the problem is this, that much of our communication in these days isn't real communication, it's information. I don't know about you, but the number of times it takes ages to to type out a text and suddenly realise, wait a minute, I'm holding a phone. Why don't I just phone the person? We were so used to just giving information than communication between each other. And we can bring that same thing into our Christian life, where basically we are so much just what we know about God rather than know him. See, and that's the crux of the matter, is that our whole life needs to be God-centred. If you're somebody who talks about your Christian life, then you're not going to be judging your Christian life, you're going to be judging your whole life. Our whole life needs to reflect Christ. Our home life, our leisure, our our work life, and our church life, and everything else we do in between. And so as far as Christians are concerned, you can get Christian books, Christian CDs, Christian DVDs, there's things on the internet, there are downloads, there are Christian apps, there's Christian TV, and we can substitute the information for communication. We can be deceived into think that we're at the forefront of what God is doing because we've got the latest songs or because we know a bit of what he's doing somewhere elsewhere in the world. So we parrot someone else's story, but we don't have much to tell people our story. And God wants to give you a story. In this time, he wants to give you a story of discovery of him. He wants to give you a story of answered prayer. He wants to give you a story of things that only he could do. He, it's, he, it's not just for some people, it's for every single person. Anyone who's listened to me, God wants to give you a story. Because we were called to live with him and have his story, which will become his history. So we need to ask ourselves seriously, how is my relationship with Jesus? Just take a minute and ask that. Do you get excited at him? You know, we sing, "'Tis music in the sinner's ear, it's the, an old hymn. "'Tis life and health and peace about his name. Or do we just treat it like the name of any celebrity? Are we in awe of him? Well, God wants to change that if your answer to that is no. He wants to show you him as he really is. There's a story told of two lumberjacks. One was an older one and one was a younger one. And they decided to have a competition one day to see who could cut down the most trees in a single day. Every hour, the older man would sit down for a bit Then he'd get up and start chopping trees down again, whereas the younger one kept at it all the time without taking a break. And at the end of the day, it was the older one who had cut down most trees. The younger one couldn't figure it out. He said, how come I've been chopping trees all the time and here's you just taking a break every time and then you would would, um, uh, start up before you started chopping again. And the older man said, Every time I stopped, I would start to sharpen my axe. And that's what it's got to be like with our relationship with Jesus. We can go on doing life, and we're so busy that actually our spiritual heart is being blunted, and we're not effective for the kingdom of God. 
And God wants all of us to stop and pause and sharpen our spiritual axe, if you like, our spiritual blade. You see, so we're all aware of that. And you know, so often we say, I must pray more and I must read my Bible more. And often we say that because we realise how unspiritual we are. I'm sure sometimes you'll go to a, a church thing and somebody who's in, 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 in tune with God does, has got maybe a prophecy or something like that. And you're saying, Wait, why can't I be like that? I need to, to seek God more. I need to pray more. I need to read my Bible more. And usually we say, I need to pray more. I need to read my Bible more because we know we should. But if our motive is only just to pray and read, then it's not the prim- it's not it's, it's actually not the main thing because the primary thing needs to be a relationship with Jesus. You know, and there's an old chorus that children's chorus that to, I will make you fishers of men. It's called, and there's a verse in it: Read your Bible, pray every day, and you will grow. I may think it's a nice childish thing, but you know something? It's such a basic principle of growing in your faith to re- read your Bible, to know what God, the Bible says, to understand the Bible, to, to recognise, uh, uh, memorise the Bible, as what we are doing uh, for a few weeks, and to pray. It keeps you in touch with God. And when you combine the two, when you pray what the Bible says, then God listens. I believe that with all my heart. So compared to... It's just to go through the motions of praying and reading our Bible, not meeting God is, a, is good, but it's not the best. Because our desire must be to know the Father, to know Jesus, and to know the Holy Spirit. You see, maybe you're someone who's you don't go to church. Maybe you, you've never met God. Do you know something? That's what you were born for, was to know him, to have an intimate relationship with him. Every human being on the planet today was created to know him intimately. Now, what can happen is we can say that I'm going to set time aside for God and we set time aside for God every single day, but they used to call it quiet times. And uh, I don't use that word now, I don't use the word quiet time because sometimes it shouldn't be quiet. But we don't, you know, you don't hear people talking about it very often. But what can happen is this, spending time with God every day can become mechanical. It can be maybe somebody's got a prayer list that they use and they just go through it, or it's set readings and, and spiritual disciplines, and spiritual disciplines are necessary in our walk with God. If you don't have a spiritual discipline, you need to get them into your heart, into your, your, your lifestyle, so that you stay tuned to the Father, because that's what you were made for. Remember, Jesus' words are, are a spirit in their life. If we don't have the, the life of Jesus in us, then we have nothing worth living for. So it can become mechanical. Another thing of spending time with God, it can become just, oh, I feel good because I've spent five days with God, and it's almost like brownie points. And, and when, that, when that happens, it can become pride. Proud, we become proud, and it's, it's almost like uh, we become self-righteous because I'm more righteous than you because you only spent four days spending time with God. Or we can deceive ourselves by spending time every single day where we think that we actually are, you know, we're, we're reading maybe somebody else's a. a it's maybe a, it would be a, like a word for the day it would be called where there's a Bible verse at the top and then somebody gives a wee spiel about it. And we think we're doing fine, but actually it's someone else's revelation we're, we're receiving. I mean, God wants to give you revelation of the Word of God. He speaks, he, he reveals his Word to us, and he speaks into our hearts. The whisper of the Holy Spirit, is, there's nothing like it. As a... As a somebody who's been preaching for a long time, for, for, for years, I would be re- spending time with God every day, but as actually it was through the eyes of a preacher. And I was looking at the Bible, not as a son to hear my father speak, but as a, somebody who was looking for a, the, the, the sermon for the, for the following Sunday. And that's a danger for anyone. Then you get Christians who are quite superstitious, superstitious about spending time with, with God every day, where They'll say, if I don't spend time with God, it'll be a rotten day. And guess what? It is a rotten day. God honours your faith. So, and it's, or you, people say, it's got to be first thing in the morning. 
There was a lady in the church many years ago and she was a school cleaner and she started work at I think half past five or six in the morning and somebody was telling her you need to spend time first thing in the morning. The woman didn't have a first thing in the morning. It's finding a set time for you what suits you best. And my life changed when I spent time after tea time with God and my life, God started to talk to me in a way I'd never uh, heard him before and, uh, and, and started to, 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 to change me and show me things that were so amazing about him. And so what can happen is when you're just doing it out of duty, spending time with God out of duty, we can become condemned and guilty if we, if we miss a day. But it's about relationship. You know, and I remember just a, a few years ago, actually, I feel like, oh, I know I, I was out of tune with God and it was going to be such a mountain to climb to reach him. And, oh, it became such a huge thing. Almost you think, what's the point of starting? But I realised that God's love for me is bigger than that. And his, his desire for a relationship with me is bigger than that. And he's just waiting for me to take that first step. Remember, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. That's a promise from the Bible. It's not a suggestion, but it's, there, it's a responsibility that's put on you to take that first step towards God and he will come to you. Because, you see, God always responds to faith. And that first step of faith opens up the door to God to come to us. I know that uh, when I've told this story before, if you at ECF, as I say to people, I've only had one life and I've got the same stories, but we were just married a year and we went to Kos on holiday. And uh, I used to, when I went on holiday uh, from my job as a minister, I actually went on holiday from God as well. And I can remember one day, it was just out of sorts. It was a really windy day and it wasn't a beach day. It had been dangerous to go in the sea. And um, the and so we're going through all these shops that sold the same stuff that was the, the kid on. It was handmade, but it was made in a factory in Athens, probably. And, uh, and I can remember saying to Jennifer, what, just saying, what are we doing in here anyway? And I was just grumpy. And I realised it's because I'd lost the life of God in me. I needed to get time with him. So I took time aside, got time with him, settled in him, received his love, the flow of his love, and then carried on. So it's so important. You see, all of us, whether you're someone who knows God or not, all of us, mankind, have an inherent ability to hear God. You see, the Bible says that faith comes through hearing the message of Christ. For someone to become a Christian, for somebody to become a child of God, to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple if you like, then we need to hear the message that God loves us, that Jesus came and died for us, that we have a problem with our sin, a rebellion against him, but Jesus, when he died on the cross, made it possible for that to be forgiven, for the blockage to be taken away, and then he rose again, as we looked at on Sunday, he rose from the dead and we can live a different kind of quality of life, the resurrection life. So even before somebody becomes a Christian, before they actually give their life to God, they hear first of him speaking. Maybe someone's hearing me to God speak today through this message. He's calling you. He's saying, come into my family. That's what you were created for, not only for this life, but for eternity, because the, because the awful thing is hell does exist. If, if you don't think hell doesn't exist, you should see what Jesus went through in the cross to save us from it. And so for me, when I think, when I see that the Bible says that Jesus was so deformed, he was just like a, a he wasn't even a, he didn't even resemble a human being. His face was just mush. His whole body was just mush. When I see that, it shows me how horrendous hell must be and how much, how great his love is for me. So all of us can hear God. And so we have to exercise that ability to hear him. And we need to experiment. And I see people in our church who don't, wouldn't hear God if he was shouting at them because they haven't listened. And I want to challenge you and I want to encourage you to say, you need to hear him. You need to hear him say, this is the way walk in it. You need to hear him give you ideas, maybe for your work. You need to hear him. In fact, some lives have been saved because people have heard God say, don't go there. So we need to sharpen our spiritual ears, don't we?
Spiritual disciplines are important. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 1.7, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power and self-discipline. And and self-discipline is one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So therefore, we need to discipline ourselves to get time with God as much as possible. So don't stop spending time with God. Spend time with him. Go out for a walk with him. You know, as I say, learn to hear what the Holy Spirit wants that time to be for. As I said, some quiet times aren't quiet. It might be a time of shout praise. It might be a time of warfare. You need to be led by the Holy Spirit. He wants each one of us to capture the incredible idea of him leading us. So I want to encourage you to use this time that we're in to seek him. You see, we're really foolish if we don't take advantage of this time. It's, it's as if the world is on sabbat, 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 sorry, sabbatical. It's as if it's having a Sabbath when there's peace all around. Nature itself is recovering from what man has done to it. And it's a time for all of us to reflect. And, you know, if you've never met Jesus, then... You can, have, you can have that opportunity right now to do that. He's waiting for you to come to him. This is an opportunity to do it just now. And I want to lead us in a prayer. It will come up in the screen. And it says, Lord Jesus, I confess that I have lived my life without really knowing you personally. I admit that I do sin and therefore I'm disqualified from heaven. I know that you died for me and that you're alive today. Please forgive me for my sins. I need you to clean my heart because only you can do that. I give my life to you and I promise to live for you every day. Jesus, I choose to follow you from now on. Thank you that according to the Bible, I'm now a child of God and that he is my eternal father. Baptize me also with your Holy Spirit because I need his power to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read that verse a bit at a time and you can say it yourself because it's important that you speak it out too. Lord Jesus, I confess that I've lived my life without really knowing you personally. I admit that I do sin and therefore I'm disqualified from heaven. I know that you died for me and that you're alive today. Please forgive me for my sins. I need you to clean my heart because only you can do that. I give my life to you and I promise to live for you every day. Jesus, I choose to follow you from now on. Thank you that, according to the Bible, I am now a child of God and that he is my eternal Father. Baptize me also with your Holy Spirit because I need his power to live for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if you felt that you said that prayer from your heart, then please get in touch with us at, uh, by email at office at ecfpaisley.org. It will be on the screen. And we, can, we want to encourage you in your new life with, with God. And also, you may want to get a, a free New Testament. This, this is a New Testament, which is about, you, you can learn more about Jesus in this. Uh, and we would send it out free if you email the, that at the, the office at office at ecfpaisley.org and we will send this out. We'll get your name and address. We'll post it out to you. And also there's a booklet here called The Big Welcome. You see, God the Father is waking, waiting to welcome you into his family. Let, let's just pray. I want to pray for us all. Father, we thank you that you want all of us to know you. Lord, I thank you that no matter how long we've known you, you want, to know us, you want us to know you better. 
And thank you, Holy Spirit, you lead us into all truth, and Jesus is the truth. So will you lead us at this time, when we are in our different various homes, Father, that you will we will get to know you more, and we will know more about Jesus. We will know Jesus more, the Father more, and know you more, Holy Spirit. Thank you that you love us. Thank you, Jesus, you died for us, that you're alive today, and we want to live for you for the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you today. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I'll raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I'll raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody I'll raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me And I'm gonna say In the middle of this storm Louder and louder I'm gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise and Death is defeated The King is alive I'll raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me I'll raise a hallelujah I will watch the darkness flee I'll raise a hallelujah In the middle of the mystery I'll raise a hallelujah Fear you've lost your hold on me I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated, King is alive. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Gonna sing a little louder. Sing a little louder Sing a little louder In the presence of my enemy Sing a little louder Louder than the unbelief Sing a little louder My weapon is a melody Sing a little louder Heaven comes to fight for me Sing a little louder in the presence of my enemy. Sing a little louder, louder than the enemy. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me. And I'm gonna sing in the middle of this storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes, hope will arise Death is defeated, the King is alive I raise a hallelujah I raise a hallelujah so raise a hallelujah We'll raise a hallelujah I'll raise a hallelujah I'll raise a hallelujah So raise a hallelujah 
praise the hallelujah. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. It's great that you could have been here with us. If you responded to that prayer in the message today, we, we'd love to hear from you. Email us at office at ecfpaisley.org and we'll get back in touch with you and we'd love to send you out some of those resources. And please do keep joining us each week. Do stay in touch. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel which will give you notifications when we post new videos. Um, but we want to pray God's blessing on you just as we finish today. Father, I want to thank you for everyone watching just now. You see them, you know them, and you love them. Lord, I pray that today they would know your love. We thank you that it is a turning point moment today for them. Father, they've come out of despair and they're moving into rejoicing. So Holy Spirit, would you come be present with them now, I pray in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. We'll see you next week.